Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new and timely series, The Church in the Last Days. While our world continues to reject the gospel of Christ and fall deeper into the pit of sin, today you'll hear the undeniable good news for God's people. The Apostle Paul founded this church in Thessalonica. And the church, he was only there for a short time, uh, as short as three weeks, as long as probably six months before persecution uh, caused him to have to leave. And the believers there were doing well. They responded well to Paul. They responded to the preaching and they were growing and growing and they were excited and Paul had taught them about the return of Christ. He had taught them about the rapture of the church. He taught them to be waiting for the Lord who was going to come and deliver them from the wrath that would come when the Antichrist assumed power. So they're waiting for all of this. But then something happened to these people. They heard a message, it says in chapter 2, verse 2. They were quickly shaken from their composure. They were disturbed because somebody came in and said they had a message from the Lord and they had a letter supposedly from Paul that said, hey, you Thessalonians, you missed it. You missed the rapture. You probably got some sin in your life and the Lord says, no, not you. And uh, you missed it. And now you're in the day of the Lord and you're going to experience the wrath of God. And it blew them out of the water. It shook them to the core because they said, that's just opposite of what Paul told us. He told us to be waiting for the Lord, that the Lord was going to come in the clouds, that the Lord was going to get us. And uh, man, I guess we missed it. I guess there was, there was too much sin in our lives. And I guess, I guess the rope broke. And I guess now, we're, you know, if you miss the rapture, that's awful. And, and now we're going to go through all this terrible wrath. And so they were freaked out and they were scared And they needed some good news. And so in chapter 2, Paul gives them good news. Now, he tells them, hey, you didn't miss the rapture. And you're not in the day of the Lord. Because in the day of the Lord, the Antichrist, the man of sin, is going to be revealed. And these terrible things are going to happen. He's going to present himself in the temple of God, uh, displaying himself as God. And uh, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be terrible, horrible things. You're not in the day of the Lord. Now, you're experiencing persecution because persecution is part of the deal. But you're not in the day of the Lord. You're not experiencing the, the wrath of God. And he goes on to tell them this is what it's going to be like for those who are left behind. But now let's talk about you. What is it like for you? And that's where he picks up in verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Paul gave them good news. Good news for God's people. And it really has to do with this rope of salvation. I really want you to see it not so much as a rope but as a chain. A chain with four links Four unbreakable links that Paul gives here in the verses that we read. Link number one, the Lord loves us. Those of us who are his children, we can rest in the fact that God loves us. He says in verse 13, we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Hey, you are people who are loved by the Lord. And God hasn't destined you for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're loved by him. He loves you. Now, he doesn't love you because of who you are. He loves you because of 
whose you are. When you are born into the family of God, you become His child, and God loves His children, and God will never stop loving His children. Scripture says, most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, God loves everyone And if God loves everyone enough to give His Son while we were yet, God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if He loves us while we're sinners, how much more, the Scripture says in Romans chapter 5, will He show His love toward those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus? God loves us, and we are beloved by the Lord. Jeremiah 31.3 says this, The Lord says to his people, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Loved you with an everlasting love. John 17, verse 23, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, he prays to the Father. He said, Father, let them know that you love me even as you have loved them. God loves you the way God loves Jesus. And Jesus loves you, the Scripture says in John 15, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. The Father loves me as much as He loves the Son. The Son loves me as much as the Father loves Him. Man, that is a lot of love. And the Bible asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of God? Romans chapter 8 asks that question. And it says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress, they were going through tribulation and distress in Thessalonica, or persecution, they were going through that. Is that going to separate us from the love of Christ? Or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Of course not. And then he says this, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Now, remember this. God doesn't love you because you're valuable. You're valuable because He loves you. He's just chosen to love us. And he says in verse 16, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us. So that's the first link in the chain. God loves you. The second link in the chain. Good news for God's people. Not only does the Lord love us, but the Lord chose us. It says in verse 13, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. The Lord has chosen us. Now, God's love for us motivated Him to send His Son to the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And Christ's love for us motivated him to say to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. And that motivated Jesus to go to the cross. And the cross is God's love letter to us. Uh, As someone said, I asked Jesus how much he loved me and he stretched out his arms and died. That proves to you that God loves you because before you were ever born, Jesus Christ died for you. And while you were yet a sinner, Christ died died for you. And so the cross makes it possible for us to have salvation. When Jesus died upon the cross and breathed his last and said, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. The Bible says there was an earthquake and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, from top to bottom, not bottom to top. If a man were going to tear the veil, he'd have to do it from top, from bottom to top. God tore the veil from top to bottom and the veil that separated the people from the holy of holies from the holiness of God that was it was open now you could come and have access to God because of what Jesus did on the cross and he says that we have been chosen those who are believers in Jesus have been chosen from the beginning from the beginning say with the beginning of what from in the beginning Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth we have been chosen 
from the beginning. And when the Bible talks about God choosing, it says he chooses based on his foreknowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens who are chosen, how are they chosen? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. And here's the deal about God. He can choose before the, the beginning, before the foundations of the earth, and he can choose based on what he knows because God is the God, Isaiah 46, verse 10, who declares the end from the beginning. God is God. He knows everything that's going to happen before it ever happens. And before he ever created this world, he knew that Adam and Eve would sin. He knew that it would plunge the world into sin. He knew that the only way to remedy the sin problem was for him to send his son for the second person in the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, to become a man and to die on the cross for our sins because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world. And so the Lord knew all that and he knew those who would trust him before he ever created this world, before the foundations of the world. He knew it all and he chose those who would trust him before the foundations of the world according to his foreknowledge. He predestined us according to his foreknowledge. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And to whom he predestined, these he also called. And to whom he called, these he also justified. And to whom he justified, these he also glorified. How did he do that? When did he do that? In the beginning, according to his foreknowledge. Here's the thing. Don't get hung up on predestination because here's the thing about predestination. God predestines according to what he knows you're going to do. It doesn't mean that God makes you do it. It just means that God knows that you're going to do it. God knows everything in your life because he knows the end from the beginning. He's seen the movie of your life. He knows every decision you're going to make. I remember when I was a, a young Christian, I would think, okay, God knows this and he knows that. I wonder if you can fake God out. Like, God, I'm going I'm to fake like I'm going right and I'm going left. I bet you didn't know that because you thought I was going right and you were going left. And God said, yeah, I've seen you. I've seen your whole life, Jeff. I know everything that you do. I know every decision that you make. I know when you try and fake right and you go left because I've seen it all. You know, it's kind of like watching a, a football game and you've, you've seen the game and you're watching it with another guy who hasn't seen the game. Well, if you study that game film of the 2005 national championship game where UT beat USC, it's a good game to watch, and you study that, you know, hey, it's going to be fourth down, and Vince Young is going to run right, and he's going to score, and the other guy's not seen it, he's like, oh, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, you're like, I know what's going to happen, because I've seen it, now, that doesn't mean that you made Vince Young do what he did, it just means you know what he's going to do, because you've already seen the game, God's already seen the game of life, he knows every decision that every person is ever going to make. And God chooses from the foundation of the world based on his foreknowledge. Remember this. See, if God, some people believe that God just kind of chooses and, and, and it's, it's his divine choice and it's uh, willy-nilly, so to speak, although they wouldn't use that terminology. But here's the thing that doesn't wash with me. The Lord is not willing, 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not willing, he's not wishing that, that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if God desired all men to be saved, but in eternity past, he says, well, you can be saved, you can't be saved. You can be saved, you can't be saved. Then it would be like, well, how, how do, I, I have no choice. I mean, I can't be saved. But he doesn't do it that way. He gives every person the opportunity and he says, whosoever will may come. Hey, if you want to be chosen, you can be chosen because, know this, God chooses those who want to be chosen. He chooses those who want to be chosen. He chooses those who respond to him. You know, it, it, some of you may remember the show Welcome Back, Cotter, and uh, Arnold Horshack. Oh, 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 remember that? Choose me, choose me. That's the way 
Every one of us who's a believer, that's what we did when we heard the gospel. We said, oh, oh, choose me, choose me. I didn't choose him. He chose me. But he chooses those who want to be chosen. You won't ever find a person in heaven say, well, you know, I didn't really want to come, but I didn't have a choice. He chose me. I, didn't, I couldn't say no. You know, it's irresistible grace. I wanted to resist, but I couldn't. Hey, the rich young ruler had the invitation from Jesus. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. And he said no. The Lord loved him. The Bible makes that clear. And the Lord gave him the invitation. Many are invited, but few are chosen because the many who are invited, so many of them say no. Hey, the Lord loves us. That's the first link in the chain. Second link, the Lord chose us. Third link in the chain, in the unbreakable chain, the Lord has given us His Spirit. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. How does that come about? Through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Sanct sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So God, the third link in the chain, is God sends His Spirit to convict our hearts, open our eyes to truth, show us that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. We put our puny little hand of faith in His great big hand of grace, and He pulls us out of the pit of sin. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the water lifted me, now safe am I. And He does that through His Spirit. And this is the most wonderful thing. The greatest gift you have is the gift of salvation. And what is salvation? See, salvation is not just getting your sins forgiven. That's really, if you get really, really technical, getting your sins forgiven is the precursor to salvation. That makes you ready for salvation. Going to heaven when you die, that's the byproduct of salvation. What salvation really is, is God coming to live in you. God coming to live in you. And when you receive Christ, He comes into your life through the person of the Holy Spirit, and you're born again. And God, you have the divine nature within you, and God lives inside of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, What do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. So, first link in the chain, the Lord loves us. Second link in the chain, the Lord chose us from the beginning. Third link in the chain, the Lord has given us His Spirit. Now, those first two links are from eternity past. The Spirit working in your life is now. That's in time. And the Spirit works in your life for the end result. And that is, the Lord wants us to share in His glory. And it was for this, verse 14 says, that he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. To gain the glory. Why all this? Why the, the, the choosing? Why the Spirit's working in my life? So that one day, one day, it hasn't happened yet, but one day so that you and I would experience the glory of God in a place called heaven so that we would be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Jesus prayed in his great high priestly prayer, John 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. The Lord wants us to see his glory. He wants us to experience his glory. He says that where I am, there you may be also. He wants us to be there with him. And, and the Bible says concerning heaven, what eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has even entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. You and I, we can't imagine, we can't begin to imagine what God has in store for us. I mean, it is greater if you let your mind out to the nth degree, you're not even scratching the surface of what is in store for us in glory. John says this, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when He appears, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. There is one day that I'm going to be like Jesus. Why? Because he loves me. Because he chose me before the foundation of the, of the world. Because in 1980, the Holy Spirit came to live in my life. And the Spirit is alive and working in me. And one day, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back in the clouds. And I'm going to be caught up to be with him in the air. And I'm going to be changed. And this perishable will put on imperishable. And this mortal will put on immortality. And I will be given a glorified body and Philippians 3 says, For our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory through the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Hey, that is coming for a Christian. And that is good news for God's people. You know what's really cool? You read about in Exodus, Moses asked the Lord, Lord, let me see your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, Moses, I'll show you the backside of my glory. I'll cover you. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over there. I'll pass by, and I'll show you the backside of my glory, the afterglow, so to speak. But you can't see my face. No man can see my face and live. The last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the last book, says that when we're in heaven, that we serve the Lord and his children shall see his face. We see him for who he is, all his beauty, all of his glory, all of his Shekinah. We see him face to face, as Sandy Patty used to sing, in all of his glory. That's what's in store for the believer. So he says in verse 15, so then brethren, stand firm. And hold to the traditions which you were taught. The transmission, not traditions of men, but what has been transmitted to you from the Lord through the apostles, through the prophets. Hold on to those, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Hey, because all this is true and those links are there in the chain and they cannot be broken, you need to stand firm in the truth. You need to hold fast to the teachings of the Word of God. You need to be comforted by the Holy Spirit who is the divine comforter and strengthened by the Spirit. Hey, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both steadfast and sure and one that enters inside the veil. Hey, do you have that hope today? Listen, if you're here today and you say, Jeff, I just don't know if I'm chosen. I don't know if God chose me from the foundation of the world. And how can that be changed? You don't know what happened in the beginning. It can be changed because God knows everything that you do. And today you can make a decision to give your life to Christ. And you know what you'll find out? If today you give a, make a decision to give your life to Christ, you'll find out that, hey, my name was written before the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life. Do you know for certain that you belong to Him? Hey, God loves you. Saved or lost, God loves you. But He wants to choose you. He's looking for somebody to say, here I am, Lord, as Isaiah said. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Save me. Change me. He wants His Spirit to do a deep work in your life. He wants one day for you to be with Him in glory. My friend, the Lord is coming soon, and the big question is this, are you ready? If you're not, today is the day to get ready. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior, I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, 
please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Today's message, Good News for God's People, is available on CD, a USB flash drive, or as an MP3 download when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Are we living in the last days? Is Jesus really coming soon? Hey, what does the Bible say? And how are we to live in these darkening days that precede the glorious return of Christ? In my new eight message series titled The Church in the Last Days, I go verse by verse through the book of 2 Thessalonians and share what God says is going to happen in the not too distant future. Now it's exciting for those who love God and it's terrifying for those who don't. I hope you'll get your copy of this new series, The Church in the Last Days, and prepare yourself for the soon return of King Jesus. For your gift of any amount to From His Heart this month, we'd like to say thank you by sending you Pastor Jeff's new timely eight-message series, The Church in the Last Days. You can get it on CDs, on a USB flash drive, or as an immediate MP3 download. Your choice. Simply call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org to invest in kingdom work through From His Heart and learn why and how to prepare the church in the last days. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.